position. Thank you for the honor of being invited to address you this evening. Before broaching my theme, I should say, by the way, I'm going to be following a text, but I'll depart from it uh, occasionally, and uh, at the end, I'll um, entertain some questions. I just don't know how many I'll be able to answer, but I'm willing to put myself on the spot. <laughs> Before broaching my theme, I feel it is only appropriate, and you would want me to begin with a short but most sincere word of commendation. naming these six, and for the moment, giving only the barest statistics of their lives and careers. Lawrence, I'm going to ask you to put that on the list, please. That note is this list, please. So we can read it together and I'll... I guess every uh, do we need that for a moment off just down a little please George please Pull the list out a little bit then. Pardon? Pull the list out. Uh, let us get the top of the sheet. Just pull it out a little bit. That's it. A little further. Now get into focus again. Yeah. Okay, put that up now. <laughs> Thank 
If I could break free of my tether for a minute, I could. <laughs> 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 Irish word. But um, the list of the people then, Cornelius O'Brien was born in New Glasgow, PEI, in 1843. He became Archbishop of Halifax in 1882. Not marked, but that's what it was. And then he died in 1906. John T. McNally was born in Hope River in 1871. He became the first bishop of Calgary in 1913, the bishop of Hamilton in 1924, archbishop of Halifax in 1937, and died in 1952. Alfred Arthur Sinnott was born in Crapo in 1877, and he became the first Archbishop of Winnipeg in 1916. He resigned in 1946 and died in 1954. Francis Clement Kelly was born in Somerville, out in the Vernon River Parish, in 1870. He became the Bishop of Oklahoma City, Tulsa in 1924 and died in 1947. James Charles McGuigan was born in 1894 in Hunter River. In 1930, he became the Archbishop of Regina. In 1935, the Archbishop of Toronto. And in 1946, he was named a cardinal. He died in 1974. Uh, Bishop Leo Charles Nelligan was born in 1900. And uh, in 1937, I believe, he became the Bishop of Pembroke in Ontario. He had to... Um, uh, in 1937, he resigned after the war, around 1945, and lived on at uh, the University of Windsor, teaching in the Department of Religious Studies, till he died uh, in the year uh, 1975, I believe. Okay, and I have the list of the There is the list. 
and if names can be re relied upon as racial evidence over that period, we have before us a group of prominent churchmen of Irish extraction and of origin in Prince Edward Island. But the question must be faced before proceeding, or perhaps several questions. Having demonstrated the absolutely minimal conformity to the directions given us, namely that we're to talk about Irish churchmen from Prince Edward Island, we have demonstrated they certainly are Irish, those names, they're from the island, and they are prominent. Do we now go on to offer five or six completely unconnected biographical notes, eventually covering the whole list, or must we feel duty-bound at least to include under each separate note some comment on the Irishness of the person, the proof that it was his Irish blood that accounted at least partly for his greatness? One approach. Or could we settle for the more or less separate and unconnected parade of our illustrious subjects, and then at the end stand back and see if we can discern three or four elements that may run through their separate histories, elements which might even have something to do with their common Irishness or their common islandership or their common bishopliness. It is, in fact, this latter approach which I have in the main adopted. Did you get a quick picture of Bishop, Bishop O'Brien? Uh, yeah, I think we, uh, this is not a good picture, but we could uh, we need to pay you extra for the studio, isn't it? The, <clears throat> this is the only picture I could get available in the time I had of Archbishop O'Brien. Um, it is a picture of a strong man, but a uh, very sensitive face. Uh, a man who, uh, while well, I'll be talking about his qualities and his achievements in a few moments, but um, I wanted to offer at least this minimum of visual uh, background in the talk tonight, some uh, portraits of the people. Uh, I think probably that's all I need to say about this man, uh, but the visual side. Cornelius O'Brien was the earliest in time of the illustrious, illustrious Irish islanders, whom we will consider this evening, and he was closest to his Irish origins. For his father, Terence O'Brien, was a County Wexford man who came in the early 1830s to Canada with his bride, Catherine Driscoll, from County Cork. They settled in New Glasgow, PEI, and there, the seventh son, Cornelius, was born in 1843. The family was very poor, his education merely the basic one of a country school. The only sign of the unusual was, it seemed, his penchant for writing rhymes, a sign in retrospect of his later literary brilliance. At school's end, he went to work in a store in Summerside from age 16 to 20, showing all the while a deep spirit of faith and a strength and innocence of character. By age 20, he recognized a call to the priesthood and gained admission to the young St. Dunstan's College. At that time, it was only uh, nine years old. In his one year there, he excelled in studies through his superior talents and assiduous effort, and he endeared himself to all by his gentle and manly behavior and unusual charm of manner. 
Bishop Peter McIntyre thereupon decided he should do his philosophy and theology at the Propaganda College in Rome. Now, lest anybody read this wrongly, um, the, our modern word propaganda is, war, is borrowed from uh, the bureaucracy of the Roman Catholic Church. The, uh, uh, in their system of government, the ministries or, or departments are not called that. The, the, the bureaucracy of the Roman Catholic Church, by the way, is older than any in Europe. So the term they give is congregation. And uh, uh, the, the uh, subject matter of the different ministries is aspects of church government. So there can be a congregation having to do with belief, with the appointment of uh, bishops, with uh, clergy, <coughs> discipline, uh, and so on. And one of these congregations has to do with missions, with the propagation. Pagus is a Latin word for a, an undeveloped area. A, uh, so to, to uh, propagate really means to, to uh, distribute out through the undeveloped areas. <coughs> So there is a proper, there is a congregation, De Propaganda Fide, for the faith to be propagated or disseminated. And uh, so this college uh, is maintained by that particular uh, congregation. The Propaganda was a great international seminary maintained by the congregation for the propagation of the faith to serve all those undeveloped dioceses around the world which were not yet able to train their own candidates for the priesthood. The Diocese of Charlottetown, like most of the few Canadian dioceses then in existence, enjoyed into the second decade of this 20th century a standing entitlement of at least one space in the propaganda. We had, by the way, uh, kind of a running stream. I'll talk about this in the second part of my lecture. We had a, 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 quite a supply of, of island clergy who studied at the propaganda. O'Brien studied there for seven years and was ordained in Rome in 1871. During those years, he distinguished himself consistently in that great international community winning many medals and eventually the gold medal for overall excellence. As an added and unusual enrichment to his Roman experience, he was living there during the very years when the revolution for Italian independence broke out afresh. And he even tried to join the papal forces defending the city against the revolutionaries. He did not succeed in that effort, but the whole tense experience surely deepened his lifelong sense of loyalty to the papacy. On his return to Canada, it was evident that his intense studies had seriously impaired his health. He could not complete two years of teaching at St. Dunstan's, nor more than a year of parish work at the cathedral in Charlottetown. He was sent to the thriving but quiet parish of Indian River, and a year later published a brilliant first book, The Philosophy of the Bible Vindicated. The peaceful setting seemed ideal for him and encouraged hopes of many years of quiet ministry and fruitful study and writing. Providence decreed otherwise. Six years later, in 1880, Bishop McIntyre took him as secretary on his ad limina visit to Rome. Some may not know that bishops are required to report in every five years to Rome. It's 
called the ad limina apostolorum, to the thresholds of the apostles. Uh, and these are called ad, ad limina visits. So McIntyre took young O'Brien with him. And in the following year, Archbishop Hannah of Halifax chose him for the same duty because of O'Brien's great knowledge of the city and its institutions. The die was cast. A year later, Hannah died. The bishops of the Maritimes put O'Brien at the head of their list of proposals for a successor to Hannah. And that same year, O'Brien became Archbishop of Halifax at the age of 39. Time will not permit here even a full sketch of O'Brien's 24-year reign as Archbishop of Halifax. He was a tireless defender of the rights of religion, especially the Roman Catholic, and yet the record seems to show his acceptance as a man of great breadth and tolerance in the eyes of all citizens. I might remark that the whole a theoretical debate about religion in schools uh, became well developed after a while, but O'Brien was in on the early part of it in Canada, and his writings on the matter were uh, kind of basic ones, often referred to by other people. Cardinal Bourne in uh, Westminster uh, knew his writings and asked him at one point to uh, submit a uh, uh, a short treatise on the matter for him to use in uh, the same discussion in England. In spite of a sensitive nature and a predilection for study and writing, he planned and implemented a huge expansion of the institutions and services of the archdiocese, particularly in the great port of Halifax. He organized many new parishes in the rapidly expanding population, for the rapidly expanding population, and he built many churches. He founded a seminary and a college and developed a religious school system. He was valued as a participant in many civic plans and discussions. And with all this, he produced a steady stream of literary work, poems, essays, and several books of doctrine, devotion, biography, and novels. He had many admirers and powerful friends of many faiths and of no faith, and friends from the peak of the social order to the bottom. <coughs> Indeed, his greatest love was for the poor. So broad were his interests and attainments that in 1896, Ten years before his death, he was elected president of the Royal Society of Canada, a post generally regarded as the peak of success in the cultural life of our country. If you even get invited to join the Royal Society, that's about as, as far as, the, as many citizens would hope to get. He was elected president. Uh, in 1896. At his death in, in 1906, at the rather early age of 63, the flood of testimonials from every quarter witnessed to the exceptional quality and achievement of the man. That is our glimpse at Cornelius O'Brien. Could we have a few pictures of our next? is Alfred Arthur Sinnott. This, we can get him to stand still now. <laughs> this is an official portrait. He is shown in the Kappa Mania. Uh, these these are not considered uh, democratic enough nowadays. A lot of style has been changed. 
when the bishop paraded into his own cathedral, he had a long cape with a train bearer walking about 10 feet behind, or at least 6 feet behind, and uh, with the ermine on the top of it and his purple beretta and the pectoral cross. And uh, so he, there we have the picture of the young Archbishop of Winnipeg. Can we quick look at No, no, uh, pardon me, uh, we have a few more other ones. This is a rather uh, later one kind of portrait. It's the face of a kindly, sensitive man uh, who knew where he was going, but who was very, very tolerant. Uh, and this appears in his face, I think. The, uh, there's a lot of mellowing by, by this time. Uh, and uh, perhaps a bit of the seafarer's uh, long-seeing eyes because of much of the travel he did. One final thing, a little near the end of his career, shown at his desk. Uh, Seven or eight years of his life, his health was impaired, and even his uh, memory, mind was going a bit. But he, but he, uh, it was a very long reign, actually, uh, uh, thirty years, continually on the spot. But uh, uh, underneath that is a prayer for victory. I'll be referring to some of the the views that he expressed uh, later on. Okay, George. Yeah. <laughs> Alfred Arthur Sinnott was born in Crapo in 1877, the son of John Sinnott and Jane Macaulay, both of them born of Irish immigrants. Jane Macaulay herself was of a gifted family, having two near relatives of the McInerney name, who achieved distinction one cousin as Speaker of the House of Commons, and the other as a well-known uh, medical doctor in St. John, New Brunswick. She was also kin to the O'Leary family of Chatham, New Brunswick, who later gave two bishops to govern Charlottetown Diocese. The Synods moved to a farm on St. Peter's Bay near Morel while Alfred was quite young. And it was here that his early character and remarkable talents received their first development, here that his deep sensitivity was formed by sea and land, by farming and fishing, and by rich community life filled with faith and the live traditions of the past. Sinnott led his classes during his higher studies at Prince of Wales and St. Dunstan's Colleges, and went on to do his theology in the Grand Seminary at Quebec, where, within three years, he achieved the difficult task of winning his bachelor's degree in both theology and canon law. It is probably this feat that earned him two more, two more years of study in Rome, where he earned the doctorate in, the doctorate in canon law at the world-famous Apollinaris Institute, and he was also ordained priest at the Canadian College in Rome in February 1900. Father Sinnott returned to Canada in 1901 and did two years of teaching at St. Dunstan's College. He then received the notable compliment of being summoned to Ottawa 
to serve as private secretary to the apostolic delegate, Archbishop Spalletti, and later to his successor, Archbishop Stagni. Synod had, in this sensitive post, almost full entree to the highest level of affairs in the church in Canada, just as he had, from the Ottawa situation, contact with the highest level of secular government in Canada. Both of these influences had a deep effect uh, on his view of church affairs, Canadian affairs, and world affairs for the remainder of his life. Synod remained at this duty for 13 years, witnessing such significant currents as the evolution from colonial to fully independent government, and in the church, witnessing such historic events as the holding of the first plenary council of the Catholic Church in Canada, which took place in Quebec in 1909. In 1916, a new archdiocese was formed in Manitoba, whose seat was to be located in Winnipeg. We will have more to say about this event <coughs> at the second half of the lecture. Monsignor Synod, as he was by that time, was chosen to become the founding archbishop, and he was to be accountable directly to Rome. Not a delegate, not any other people, directly to Rome. Winnipeg was already an important center as the gateway to the Canadian West, and it was even then one of the most cosmopolitan cities of Canada because of the first wave of European immigrants to reach this country once Canadian policy had endorsed this mode of expansion. Further, the diocese was notable for qualities of almost the opposite sort from those first mentioned, namely, the size was immense and stood as a prime example of the Canadian reality, vast stretches of empty land with every variety of physical environment and every species of flora and fauna. The development and organizing and governing of this land and its varied inhabitants would require remarkable talents and a colossal stamina. By all accounts, Synod was the right man for the job. His vast missionary voyages, often in dead of winter, his staying in the huts of Eskimos and Indians, all of these earned for him the title of Peregrinus Pro Christo, a traveler, a wanderer for Christ. For 30 years, until he retired in 1946, Synod governed this diocese and became a part of the very landscape of Winnipeg as that city developed from practically a frontier capital to one of the most modern cities in Canada. The Archbishop was a superb administrator and a financier whose faith-filled ventures regularly shocked the experts at the start and just as regularly seemed to shock, shock them in the opposite sense by their unexpected success. But it was above all through his personal gifts that he seemed to have achieved his widest and most lasting successes. He was a speaker and a writer of exceptional power, and he used his powers to build community across all ethnic and religious lines of division. I was about to add the term political lines, but I hesitated. The closing section of my talk will attempt to explain why. Synod's wide ecumenical sense produced excellent results. And this tolerance was further manifested in a quite unusual openness to changes in the church long before this became the vogue with the holding of the Vatican, Vatican Council II. This must not be taken to mean that this illustrious prelate was ever anything but very orthodox. By temper and training, 
he was far too conservative to abandon tradition lightly. In closing, one should mention Archbishop Sinnott's great loyalty to his friends and his origins. He never forgot his island home and friends and was proud to refer to them. Uh, you will notice that the, the level I'm operating on is, is really just a kind of sketch. It's a popular treatment. That I make no pretense of giving a scholarly covering. But I'm giving you an introduction to these people, and I hope you will become interested in go and examine. I believe, um, well, we have in the room here tonight, uh, Judge Malawi, who is uh, a mine of historic facts in a couple of areas, and uh, I believe he brought back from Winnipeg uh, quite an amount of material that's available in the archives. I learned about it very late. We we'll pass on to the third man. Some pictures, please. Next subject. This is John T. McNally, uh, who was um, on the same letter, who was first of all Bishop of Calgary, then Bishop of Hamilton, and finally Archbishop of Halifax. Uh, so you can get you can get something of the strength there, the determination. That's a big brow that indicates quite a brain, and there was one there. Okay? Can you be sure to get his hand in, please? that up a little bit, George, please. Just okay. Catch him quickly. Getting in full focus. They are. So it's a rather dark picture, but um, can we change that focus a little bit? There you are, then. That's good enough. This is uh, apparently a restless character. Uh, you would not expect him easily to abandon any course of action he had decided on, or even that he was dimly thinking of. Uh, he, um, he would remind you of Churchill in the stance in uh, many of his portraits. He, uh, it's almost an indignity for someone to dare you know, take his picture. Can we get one last one there, please? I want you to look at the eyes here. Would you like to pick a fight with this one? <laughs> or gestures to gain attention or to create an impression. Yet he possessed such strength of will and even such physical power and stamina that he always seemed to be on the aggressive. An example close to home here. In 1929, when the Diocese of Charlottetown was celebrating the centennial of its establishment, 
waves of native sons and daughters returned to the island to help mark the occasion, including, of course, the four or five current wearers of the Episcopal purple sprung from the island soil. The air was heavy with patriotic fervor, and each bishop rising to speak boasted of his island origin. When McNally's turn came, he chose, characteristically, to prick the balloon with his opening remark, I too, through no fault of mine own, was born on PDI. <laughs> He was indeed born in Hope River in 1871, and after graduating from Prince of Wales College, he went to finish his arts degree at the University of Ottawa. After that, he spent his first five years of Roman study, if more later, residing in the Canadian College in the great mother city of Christendom, and earning doctorates in philosophy and theology. He was ordained there in 1896, and then returned to Canada to be assigned first to parish work in the Ottawa area. But owing to poor health, he moved after two years to Portland, Oregon, where he served as secretary to the Archbishop and as pastor of the cathedral. After that, he was sent for two more years of study to Rome. In 1903, he returned to Canada and spent the next 10 years in parish work in the Ottawa Archdiocese. In the midst of this period, he was appointed notary, or official secretary, in 1909 for the first, his first plenary council mentioned above. That was a very historic meeting in Canada, the first meeting of all bishops of Canada, held in Quebec, but of course the uh, apostolic delegate and others uh, were there. McNally was, at the time, just in parish work. But he was appointed notary for that, the official secretary and guardian of the documents. That this appointment was prompted by official recognition of his extraordinary ability can be seen from a remarkable feat which he performed in the Apostolic Delegate's office in Ottawa in 1912, some two or three years after the council ended. I remind you that uh, the documents that come out of a big council like this are hammered out in debate. Lawyers and theologians have to check them out, and there can be quite a wrangle over individual words and punctuation. Uh, it, it is uh, one of the more demanding uses of language to frame things that are going to have to stand there as the rule for years to come. At any rate, this day at the, in the Apostolic Delegate's office, filling in without any notice in an emergency caused by absence of the proper parties, McNally translated in the space of some two hours all the decrees of the council from French into English without their ever having to be retouched. Uh, now he, mind you, was, he had worked in the council, he was familiar, but uh, that is a tour de force. In 1913, by the way, I might mention too that he was known as a, um, a master of language. He, uh, he knew Latin, of course, very well, but he knew English and French and Italian and German fluently. And in Italian, he was even quite a master of the several dialects. Uh, he was a uh, he was quite a connoisseur of art and composed a lot of poetry. <clears throat> In 1913, McNally was appointed as first bishop of the newly created Diocese of Calgary. The territory assigned to this diocese was a vast, sprawling one, 
served by a jumble of devoted but almost nomadic religious. They were all in there pitching, but there wasn't much structure to the thing, and they were all looking after immediate needs. Right? And the people themselves who were to be served had no roots or permanence as yet, and used a lifestyle that had little in it of refinement or stability. The work of organization was total from the ground up, and the subjects, that is the people, to be organized were often of any mind but one that welcomed direction. The last thing they wanted was organization. Oil and water were to be combined, and combined they would be, even if most of the parties to be affected did not as yet realize their fate. They were going to end up next. It would take several books to do justice to McNally's ten years in Calgary, merely from the point of view of his wrangling over his absolute authority. Much of the problem involved almost a paranoia over the French domination, as he would have it, of the Canadian West. More will be said of this later, in the second half of the, my talk, but to focus the struggle for a moment before laying it aside, within some three years, McNally had alienated or outright banished most of the sizable number of religious clergy already in place, upon whom he should have counted to attack his huge job. He sent them packing. He wrangled with them, and when they wouldn't bend, tough. And, uh, having lost these, he now had to develop diocesan clergy of his own. He had also to erect stable parishes, build churches, provide Catholic schools, or at least religious instruction, and defend Catholic doctrine, rights, and standards in the wild western melee of public and political debate. He succeeded greatly by all accounts. By 1924, when he left Calgary to become Bishop of Hamilton, on Catholic education and on institutions that would reflect the grandeur of the faith and of the Catholic Church. He was as prominent as ever in public debate, and many were the loyal hearts that thanked God for such a fearless and redoubtable defender of orthodoxy. May I ask permission to quote a, a few pages reporting such a controversy? The quote, by the way, comes from a recent history of Roman Catholicism in Nova Scotia, entitled Every Popish Person, by Brian Hannington. It was a history published in 1984 by the Archdiocese of Halifax. And I cite this because, as I think you'll agree, it has a new relevance in our own situation today. This was written at the early 30s, and uh, we might be surprised to hear of some of the wild ideas that were there. In fact, they were, they were contemporary with uh, the wild ideas of Europe. Canadian attempts to deal with the severe realities of the Great Depression in the 1930s produced a wide variety of imaginative schemes. Most of these schemes saw the depression as the result of economic factors, soluble only through further economic maneuvering. Some, however, saw the national slump as explainable in sociological terms and advocated social programs to improve the situation. By far the most bizarre of these was the campaign led by the Lieutenant Governor of Ontario, <coughs> Herbert S. Bruce, to identify and forcibly sterilize any mentally retarded Canadian contemplating marriage. 
The basis for the program was the paranoiac fear that the Canadian genetic pool was disintegrating. Like-minded fanatics were recommending racial purity in Germany at the time, and the Canadian rationale for mass sterilization of the less than perfect was no more, sci no more scientifically founded and no less zealously lobbied. Russo's thesis declared that Canada was rapidly becoming a racially inferior nation due to the increasing propagation of the mentally unfit. In an address before the Canadian Club in the early 30s, he warned that the country was, quote, rapidly approaching racial disintegration, unquote, prophesying that, this is a longer quote, if the increase were allowed to continue at the present rate for another 75 years, one half the population of Canada would be in insane asylums and the other half would be laboring solely to support them. The remedy, the recourse which can save us from the horrors incidental to a continued spread of deficiency, is sterilization for individuals contemplating marriage when there exists the taint of insanity, mental deficiency, or epilepsy in the family history. It is above all desirable that we look into the possibility of social legislation which will prevent the marriage of mental defectives until, first of all, they be sterilized." Unquote. Within a few months of its introduction to the Canadian Public Forum, the mandatory sterilization campaign had attracted enough of a following to become a major media issue. Impassioned rebuttals <coughs> were made by politicians, scientists, and community groups, and the debate itself degenerated into a technical argument over whether or not human genes are able to repair themselves once made imperfect. When church leaders got a hold of the issue, the focus changed rapidly from the scientific elements to the ethical. The spokesman for Roman Catholic concerns was the Bishop of Hamilton, of Hamilton, Ontario, John T. McNally, who launched a counterattack vilifying O'Brien, one of the early thinkers behind this, for his treatment of humanity as no more than another species of animal. In the pulpit and in the press, Bishop McNally, who later became Archbishop of Halifax, cited the fundamental human values of respect and love and maintained that human life has intrinsic importance independent of social function. Quote, we must stand at all times as our Holy Church does, no matter what her enemies say, for human liberty and protection of the poor and oppressed, the safeguarding of the weak and suffering, mentally or physically. Mental disease is not a crime for which one should be punished. If we, if we make a study of family histories, we shall find genius and idiocy, crime and sanctity, mixed in the bewildering way in which nature works, and it is not easy to destroy weeds and spare the grain. The response of the Catholics under the guidance of Bishop McNally commanded both the attention and the agreement of all but a few advocates of sterilization. And McNally's remark, quote, when man decides who has the right to kill and to die, he is playing a game he is completely unqualified to be at. That remark was quoted in newspapers across the nation. The issue of the legislative control of births submerged and remained in that state until the 70s when it resurfaced as the painful pro-life, pro-choice debate on abortion. The man was ahead of his time. And how valuable he would be as a spokesman today. Now he built several excellent high schools, expanded the Catholic school system, and above all, built perhaps the most beautiful Catholic church in Canada, the Cathedral of Christ the King, 
burdening the deities thereby with an immense debt. In 1937, McNally was elevated to Archbishop and given the Archdiocese of Halifax to govern. Back home now in the Maritimes, he betrayed no hint of his increasing years. He tightened discipline, repulsed any attacks on Catholic rights and doctrine, and as always, emphasized the need of solid education, pride, and loyalty, and obedience. He received immense respect, but also often aroused bitter enmity and resentment. It was wartime soon after he arrived, and he went to such a point to support the crown and the war effort that he assigned 10% of his priests to chaplaincy duty in the armed forces, practically ordered every parish to invest in war bonds, and made it a stern duty for all to support the armed forces and the war effort by any other means. His last and rather tragic effort was once again inspired by emphasis on Catholic education, but also reflecting his weakness for grandeur. He built a new St. Mary's University on such a, the one that you see there today, on such a scale that all marveled at its quality, but quaked at its cost. <laughs> uh, as a matter of fact, in order to bankroll this venture, he eventually had to mortgage every parish in the diocese to the point and control the expenditures where no parish was allowed to get into anything about $5,000 expense without clearance, and the clearance was hard to get in the chancery. And eventually it went to the wire, uh, I mean, this is not scandal, it's public record. At, at one point, it was so close to bankruptcy of the diocese that it was a two or three hour break when the main construction company was prepared to declare bankruptcy because midnight was their deadline, and uh, a devout Catholic, Stanbury, who was also a very wealthy, wealthy uh, stockbroker, had a private line of credit with the Royal Bank for something like a quarter of a million, which he made available, which saved the construction company, which delayed the crisis for the archdiocese, and eventually with the kind of um, uh, terribly tight financing uh, saved the archdiocese. Um, I think that is all I can say for the present. Uh, it's just enough of a sketch to whet your appetite perhaps, and I think we can leave it at that for a break and come back after.
and get the tray up. No, no, it will come up tired now. Just showing me a picture. You can hear of the um, the consecration of Francis Clement Kelly uh, as Bishop of Oklahoma. A kind of link here. Standing up there is his friend, Alfred Sinnott, who came up from uh, Winnipeg. They had been together in St. Dunstan's, at least uh, for a short time. <coughs> and here you cannot see the man, but up there was uh, an iron-willed person, very prominent in American church history, George Cardinal Mundelein, uh, who came from New York diocese and who, uh, who was one of the strongest administrators in the United States, a Cardinal Archbishop of Chicago for many years. And that was where Kelly lived uh, during part of, of his career. And this is, uh, we, we don't have a very good focus, I'm sorry for that, and I was not able to get a full portrait if you want to get a good seal portrait, if you go to um, UPEI and enter the Kelly building, and step inside and start downstairs. On your right, there is a huge oil portrait of Francis Clement Kelly before he was a bishop. Ed, please, the last. What I want to speak on in the second half is. Uh, and of a quick view of the career of Francis Clement Kelly. Now, logically, after that, I should go on and talk about the greatest of all of the uh, churchmen of Irish extraction who became famous in Canada, Cardinal James Charles McGuigan. Uh, the subject is simply too big for me to fit under this, so I'm that's material for a separate talk sometime. In fact, any one of the people I've talked about, as you can guess, is probably good for two or three talks. Uh, so I'll not be mentioning McGuigan this evening. I might make a few, uh, might give a thumbnail sketch of, of his career in connection with one point I want to make. But generally, it will be a talk on Kelly, and then after that, a uh, kind of overview of these four careers to try to draw a few uh, lessons from them. <clears throat> Francis Clement Kelly was born in Somerville in 1870. 
the second of the six children of John Kelly and Mary Ann Murphy. Three of the four grandparents of Francis were born in Ireland and the fourth in Scotland. The Kelly and Murphy names still persist through southern Kings County and the various connections could probably still be traced and rehearsed by many of you. Frank was only five years old when his family moved to Charlottetown, but already he had struck his roots in the country and there had picked up some of his most basic skills or habits. Love of nature, love of people, a rugged honesty, and a direct way of judging the true worth of people. In Charlottetown, his father became a well-known businessman and prominent citizen. A year or two ago, when he sort of came to mind, he was one of the original uh, commissioners of the waterworks when they were founded in 1885, I think, 86. Frank went through St. Patrick's or Queen Square School and then St. Dunstan's College, and it was there that he developed, on the one hand, his remarkable command and love of language, and on the other, the other hand, his flair for management and finance. Besides excelling in studies and winning the Governor General's gold medal in his final year, he edited the college magazine and was secretary treasurer of several organizations. Next, having recognized what he hoped was a vocation to the priesthood, Frank proceeded with training toward this goal. Three of his four years of training were spent at French language seminaries in Quebec, and the remaining year, actually his second one of the four, was spent in the ancient manner of bygone centuries. He lived with the bishop and served as his secretary, Bishop Rogers of Chatham. He considered this the finest year of his whole education. After ordination, he was accepted to serve in the Diocese of Detroit as assistant in the town of La Pierre. Debt was a problem here, and after five years, he enlisted as a chaplain in the American Army during the Spanish-American War. He did this primarily to earn money to pay against the parish debt. But the experience also made a sad addition to his understanding of human nature. And it was this experience, too, that thrust him some years later into a bloody arena of the faith namely when he had to be the main herald trumpeting the terrible communist persecution in Mexico, and when he had to serve as the main spokesman to the United States government for the Mexican bishops in exile. Returning home to his parish, he next joined in a very popular entertainment at that time, the traveling lecture circuit. He was reportedly a spellbinder of a speaker, and his travels took him all over the American West. And it was here that he got the insight that led to the greatest single achievement of his career, the founding of the Catholic Church Extension Society. This grew out of an idea borrowed from one of the old line Protestant churches, whereby well-off areas of the church were urged to share their plenty with the needy branches of their denomination. Kelly, in his travels, had seen so much need and squalor and destitution among poor Catholic settlements of the outlying regions that he longed to tell everyone about the need and to organize to address the problem. The story of how he fought to persuade the powerful archbishops of wealthy cities, as well as the most influential Catholic laymen, to attack the terrible need, this story is a long and stirring one, but it ended in a great and continuing triumph. Extension eventually grew so fast and so far that at its very peak, it was once erecting one new chapel per day somewhere in the United States. It attracted great attention, by the way, through the novel idea of the chapel car. 
memories are disappearing so much that this example wouldn't have much force soon. But if uh, three or four of these went into operation out through vast remote areas, the idea involved a large railway coach car completely equipped as a chapel and having half its space for a congregation picked up in those desolate areas not able to be reached in any other way. Um, a cousin of his, um, the uncle of Mike Hennessy, um, George Hennessy, later knighted by the Pope, Sir George, was in charge of these uh, chapel cars and uh, traveled with them. But it was in the Extension Society, likewise, that Kelly's literary gifts came to the fore, since the greatest weapon to move public opinion at that time was a first-class periodical or magazine. Eventually, the monthly magazine Extension had a national <coughs> circulation and had great influence in the debates on all public issues. And it required its editor to have first-hand acquaintance with all leading issues and public personages. And the boy from Somerville had not inherited the habit of kowtowing before any of the mighty, so he conversed regularly with presidents of the USA and other political leaders, as well as with leaders from every sphere of life. And on the side, he began a lifelong Within the church itself, though, Kelly had bumped into very strong forces. Missions are a branch, and a very important branch, of church government, somewhat comparable to what colonial activity was for civil powers in the 19th century, the age of empire. For civil powers, this colonial activity could yield great wealth but it was also tied directly to military risks and to the whole complex field of foreign affairs. Similarly, the church had great stakes in the missionary activity. And in addition, she had allowed her private sector to become official partners in the venture. Ordinary Christians organized into grassroots funding associations. The missions referred to through all this had always been foreign missions. And as stated, they had grown into a branch of church life jealously controlled and fiercely guarded by powerful churchmen. But Kelly had stumbled onto something new, home missions. And he had a long and wearying fight at the highest levels before he won recognition and control for his great idea. And in the process, he became closely acquainted with popes and with cardinals at the highest level. This, in turn, produced completely unforeseeable involvements and challenges. For example, at the Treaty of Versailles, which ended World War I, it was agreed to make Germany the scapegoat for the whole conflict and to strip her of all her wealth and resources whereby she might ever again offer a threat to peace. This involved closing all the German Catholic missions in Asia and Africa, well known to be the finest Catholic missions in the world. Kelly spotted this and raced to Versailles to lobby long and loud against the dismantling of the German Catholic missions. He did not win, but in the exercise he probably taught some important people some very important lessons. And in rather quick succession after that, he became an important arbitrator between British, American, and Irish bishops 
who could not escape involvement in the bitter fight then raging for national independence for Ireland. Finally, Kelly is credited, credited with having been the first to originate several proposals that led to the solution of the Roman question. I'll digress a moment to explain that. The, um, uh, over the centuries, different temporal rulers uh, expressed their uh, reverence for the papacy and their gratitude by making grants of land made for problems of lay investiture and so on there in the long history of the church. But the last remnants of this involvement in temporal rule was uh, a set of feudal states that were grouped around Rome. In fact, they spread, they formed a band right across the peninsula of Italy. They were the papal states. And the pope or various uh, archbishops and so on, uh, were rulers. They were temporal rulers of these places. If you visit the city of Rome, there's all kinds of evidence of it, the, uh, uh, where the popes were actually the, the temporal rulers and there would be fountains and buildings all with big inscriptions saying that this or that pope uh, provided this for the needs of the people and so on. The popes were temporal rulers. They were temporal rulers as well as spiritual of a group of feudal states that formed a band right across the center of Italy. The great revolutions that swept all over Europe at that time, claiming self-rule for all masses of ordinary people, these revolutions swept over Italy too. The popes lost their temporal domains on which they counted for revenue to operate and Pius IX, in protest, shut himself in as a prisoner behind the massive walls of the Vatican region of the city of Rome. Uh, across the Tiber River, there was the Janiculum Hill and a small Vatican Hill, and that's where they, where St. Peter was buried. It was actually a very shady area in uh, pagan times in Rome, uh, the, the Latin word vatis is a, is a seer, a prophet. Vaticinium is a prophecy, to, to prophesy. It got that name because that's where the witches live, over on that side of the place. And if you wanted to consult a uh, seer, you went over across the Vatican, the, the, the Tiber. And the, so it became a much more honorable name later on. There's not much soothsaying goes on in Rome right now. But at any rate, uh, the, uh, that was only one region of the city. It's hardly, uh, the region is hardly uh, a mile square now. Um, but it is, um, uh, it is today a state. I'll be talking about it later in this uh, second half. Um, but at first it was a place where the Pope shut himself in in protest, uh, saying that uh, he did not admit that the people, the democratic regime that swept over the whole of Italy and set up a new country, that it had any right to these states. So the Pope is there under protest. And he remains locked in until 1929, when the matter was settled by the, the Lateran Concordat uh, <clears throat> under Mussolini. Only after that did the Pope uh, feel himself free to uh, set aside the principle. And it was actually only under John the Twenty-Third that uh, he uh, began to use this. I think Pius the Twelfth may have done it once or twice out into the city, but uh, at any rate, only in 1929, under the dictator Mussolini, was this matter settled to the satisfaction of all, and the popes regained their independence and happily reverted to being, once again, only spiritual rulers. 
some of the work that Kelly did at Versailles, some of the imaginative ideas for uh, working out a compromise with uh, the church and uh, missions and temporal groups, those ideas apparently um, were very, very useful in the fashioning of the final resolution of the Roman question. And uh, that was another uh, thing where he got recognition. In 1924, Kelly was named Bishop of the Missionary Diocese of Oklahoma City, Tulsa. It is in a state which lay along the northern border of Texas, which had a large and long-established population of American Indians, mixed with all the wealth and transient residents often associated with the oil industry. It was a natural enough appointment for the hero of home emissions, and Kelly attacked the job with vigor. Now, on top of his continued interest in national and international affairs, he had that deepest share in the sufferings of Christ, the loneliness, the frightening responsibilities of and the never-ending demands upon a Roman Catholic bishop, a successor of the Apostles. Even here, Kelly managed to explore new ground. He enjoyed close and most respectful friendships with wealthy oil magnates who had little or no religion, and with such fiercely free-thinking journalists as his great friend H.L. Mencken. In education, too, Kelly made imaginative and widely discussed proposals to marry, in, marry, in a sense, public university operations with the more traditional and religious models. Kelly was once nominated to become the Bishop Rector of the Catholic University of America in Washington, and early in his career, he was given honorary doctorates by three famous universities, Notre Dame, Laval, and Louvain. Belgium. Kelly, who by no means lacked ambition, would have liked very much during his later years to be moved to a larger or more influential diocese. It was a cross in his later years that this recognition was denied him. Still, one would have thought that few conquests or desires could remain for one who has been described as one of the top two or three figures in the church in the United States in the 20th century. And how many could point to a list of such high achievement? Visionary and administrator, preacher, speaker, and writer, writer of some 20 books, uh, all of them really serious, uh, seriously concerned with his spiritual responsibility, but using great originality to get the idea across. Uh, uh, novels and uh, fantasies. The, there are about 20 of them. I'll give George a list of these that he may want to uh, Xerox and give to people. Uh, so he is speaker and writer, journalist, diplomat, and bishop. And with it all, he never forgot his place of origin or ceased to acknowledge his debt to it. His memoirs, entitled The Bishop Jots It Down, offer a loving portrait of the island. <coughs> he left his library to St. Dunstan's University, and the campus of UPEI still includes a prominent and beautiful building that bears his name. I think I will leave it at that. I might tell you that the Diocese of Oklahoma commissioned a um, a biography of Kelly, which was done by Monsignor Gaffey in uh, Santa Barbara Diocese in California. He came here and did research and wrote a two-volume biography <coughs> which was hailed by, by some people, uh, uh, John Tracy Ellis, Dean of Church Historian, Catholic Church Historians in America, uh, hailed it as a piece of biography America now has something to set against Wilfred Ward's uh, uh, biography of Cardinal Manning, which is a kind of classic. And uh, so as a fine piece of writing, it's outstanding. And Kelly comes up with a little uh, gaffy painting and warts and all. 
uh, he comes out of it as one of the top people in the American church in this century. Well, now I'm going to leave Kelly aside for a moment and move into the last part of my remarks. Uh, can we learn any lessons from this overview? Uh, I want to remark first of all that um, how bishops are chosen. Uh, it's a nice thing if they're holy, but they don't have to be. There was an old rule in the Middle Ages, uh, how I'm throwing a few little Latin words here, he said, Sanctus est ores provovis, uh, doctus est dolce vos, prudens est regat vos. Uh, if a man is holy, get him to pray for you. If he's learned, get him to instruct you. If he is prudent, let him govern you. The gift of rulers is prudence. Prudence is the queen of the moral virtues. Uh, you might describe it as, um, it, it sort of uh, assumes that the uh, other cardinal virtues are there of justice to straighten out your heart, of uh, temperance and fortitude to regulate your appetites, to get you in shape. Now you're all ready for action. You can discern things clearly, and you should be able to make good decisions, but that's the key, that's the, the keystone of the whole thing. To be prudent, you have to have a highly developed sense of the whole picture. It, it involves intelligence so that you can see it, but also that you can anticipate the practical consequences. So you have to have a highly developed sense of judgment. You have to have the strength to go ahead and make a decision based on it. And you have to have enough character to follow through and make sure that the thing gets to the end. To begin a job, to continue with it, to complete it. That's the virtue of prudence. And, um, it is the most prized quality of bishops. They don't always hit a winner, but that's what is expected. A person has to have demonstrated that. Uh, I've read some of the bulls naming them, and one of the terms they use is usus rerum. They know how to handle matters. So, bishops. Uh, it, it is also nice if they can be holy and if they can be learned. Uh, I might illustrate this with a little story. Uh, the Europeans are great at these little cartoons or stories. Sometimes they're a bit irreverent, but they often cut right to the heart of the matter. Uh, the um, American bishops, or the American church has a big school in Rome uh, the North American College, and uh, it doesn't do much teaching. It's mainly a residence and a house of formation where the young seminarians go out to one or other of the Roman universities, the Gregorian, the Angelicum, the Lateran, and several other first-class ones. But uh, many of these people are, most of them are sent there because they are good material. I think they're, going to, they're being groomed for the top spot. Uh, so, the, uh, when you hear of any bishop being named, you'll often notice that he studied in, in Rome for a while. So the joke went that um, to be a bishop, three things were required. You had to be legitimate to be born and legitimate. You had to be baptized, and you had to have studied in Rome, but in case of necessity, the first two could be dispensed from. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, 
Um, you'll notice that the first three bishops we spoke about tonight had that background. And I'd like to point out to you that uh, we have some advantages today of people who have done graduate work, but from other points of view, uh, we're far behind what we had up until 1915. Uh, at that time, we had a, a, a stream of people, but, well, they would come one at a time, but it was a, an unbroken stream of people who had done their studies in Rome, who, uh, who uh, traveled some around Europe. They knew the universal church. They had experienced it. They had a sense of it. They had a long, long perspective. They knew what history was. And uh, they didn't learn just some theory. They were able to see effects of this or that heresy or that mistake made in the church. And it was a marvelous background for people to have uh, in local churches. So at times, we would have had as many as uh, four or five um, uh, people who had had that training. Uh, Archbishop O'Brien, uh, had a couple of nephews that became priests, and one of them was a, a legend in his diocese, Father Terry Campbell. He had a brother, Cornelius, or Khan, who was, uh, died earlier, but he was over in, uh, in Halifax. But uh, old Father McIntyre, A.J., who lived at St. Joseph's, or served, he was a chaplain there for a long time, uh, McIntyre was nephew of Bishop Peter McIntyre and was sent to Rome when he was 12 years old. And stayed there until he was <coughs> born. And uh, Father Felix Connolly and Father D.P. Croken, Father Poirier, uh, oh, there was quite a list of them. Um, so these people had a sense of the church. Um, they, they also got a good spiritual foundation. Now, can we see anything Irish in this whole thing? Well, about the the one who spoke most about being Irish was Bishop Kelly. Uh, he made no bones about it. He was uh, really anti-British. He had all kinds of good friends who were. English uh, men and women of letters, or powerful in politics, but the British in general, he, uh, he was vehemently American in this sense. He had no sympathy for the British, uh, and a great deal of sympathy for the Irish. Uh, and, um, but the others, O'Brien, whose father was from there, we, we don't hear him speaking much about uh, about uh, Irish things, nor Synod, nor McNally. Instead, I'm going to mention to you a couple of little things. Uh, let no one take offense. I'm just uh, talking about some facts of life on the thing. Uh, Archbishop Synod, with this uh, fine background of Rome, and then 13 years in the Apostolic Delegate's office, had a marvelous background. Uh, he had a doctorate in canon law. He was a great administrator. And, uh, uh, and he went to Winnipeg when a new diocese was set up <coughs> in uh, 1916. That was, the rest, that was his life work, the next 30 years. Well, this is well and good, and he did a grand job of it, but I remember meeting, uh, in 1980, I had the privilege, that was one of the visits, I, one of the stays I myself had in Rome. I was staying at the Canadian College, uh, and now it is just a small place. It was always just a residence for Canadian priests studying in uh, the Roman universities. Now it's only a big, uh, an apartment building that houses about um, six, 15 people and uh, guest rooms for two or three and two or three sisters that uh, maintain the place. 
But Kennedy bishops will often stop over there. And one time, for a week, there was Archbishop Ackel, H-A-C-K-O-L-T, uh, who stopped off. He was Archbishop of St. Boniface.